Ray Dispatch, and she points at this address. What, what, what's that address that just came up on the computer? It's her address. At her apartment complex, there was a report of a suspicious vehicle. That's weird. Whoa. Wow. Uh, I think it's time. We're streaming live on the okay. internet, so uh, I think it's time. Sure. Well, good afternoon there, commissioners. Uh, I, uh, first off, I just want to say I appreciate you giving us, giving us this opportunity to elaborate on our proposed uh, 2015 budget there. Uh, right off the bat, I understand you have some, uh, some difficult decisions ahead of you. And as I've said, uh, maybe mentioned, we went through a lot of consternation, a lot of reviewing, and a lot of forecasting, and uh, put in this budget together there. And, and I know with uh, some of the tasks that you, you have is some of the things that we're going to probably just transfer for you to deal with a little bit later on there. But first of all, I'd just say, you know, basically in, co in accordance to our mission statement uh, with the uh, Shawnee County Sheriff's Office, basically it just we just try and uh, <coughs> illustrate that we're committed to working with uh, with our community, being a partner, and doing it honorably uh, with integrity and professionalism. And, and of that, just like you, we uh, uh, at the Sheriff's Office are tasked to uh, be fiscally responsible for the tax dollars that are uh, placed out there. So with that, that's what I want to get into as far as what we've done of, of trying to bring this together uh, in our proposal there. First off, you know, we were talking about some of the challenges, some of the, uh, I guess, some of the accomplishments or successes that we had, and then we go right into uh, what we proposed for the budget there. But obviously, one of the challenges, or the, probably the key challenges that we have, is, is staffing. Uh, when uh, we look at over the last few years, we've been able to function, uh, and each year has gotten a little bit difficult to function with less and less employees. And uh, when we look at right now, we're uh, basically about 18 deputies down uh, in our staffing, and we're about 19 down in our uh, dispatch or our communication. Uh, those are just two key elements right there, but when you look at those are just elements that, that the public deals with, but behind the scenes when we talk about clerical, uh, we're short staff as well. Uh, so in, in all of this right here, those are our challenges that we have of either for the past and what I see of the, of the future. And understanding some of the fiscal constraints that we have from the state pushing in, uh, those responsibilities down to the local governments there makes it even more difficult when we try and, 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 try and uh, adequately staff uh, our agency with that. So. Uh, one of the concerns that we have, I, let, let's just talk about dispatch and our, our dispatchers right now. Right now, we are not at full capacity for those that are there, um, just so we can staff the communications 24-7. We basically ha we're required, we require our employees to work overtime. So in, in essence, an individual could actually work a full shift go home for a few hours and is required to come back and work several more hours of overtime. Uh, over a period of time, that does have a fatigue factor. Uh, and, and that's a concern for me because when we have individuals that are taking emergency phone calls, it's, it's very important to make sure we get an adequate, accurate information, such as uh, someone gives a, an address of, a, of someone that's possibly having a heart attack. And uh, when you're fatigued, uh, it becomes a factor of whether you give the correct address, take the information out, send it out, and those types of things right there. So that becomes one of our challenges of what we've been trying to do and deal with there. Along with that, <coughs> excuse me, some of the other challenges that we have uh, is just the staffing out in the field or, or what have you. Uh, when I'm talking about 18 deputies down, uh, basically, we're running at a minimum of each shift. Uh, and then we run into a situation where uh, there is a situation uh, incident. Uh, I'll take, for example, uh, back in April, April 20th, there was a, uh, a crash, uh, automobile crash, and then a disturbance 
between the driver to the occupants of the different vehicles there. Turns out there was a shooting involved on, on uh, US 24 highway. And from that, and an investigation, we actually did rely on the police department to come in and assist us with that. But from the, our investigation there, basically that tied up everyone that was available on our shift. When you have individuals go to the hospital, when you have the crime scene itself, and you have witnesses that you have to deal with, and you have to deal with those type of things, basically we were put in a position where we had to call people in to manage the rest of the shift, or at least what was going on in the rest of the county. So these are types of incidents that we have where we have to basically rely on overtime or the, the, due to the shortages that we have of one incident or so. And there are several others. One that it comes to mind that I was involved with actually was last Thanksgiving out in Silver Lake where we had an individual that had caused a disturbance at one local business. And then because of that, of his violence and the, the, uh, the point of using a weapon, uh, this individual was ha created a standoff for the officers. So we, had, we actually had to alert our uh, SWAT team and other officers that were involved with that. That was one thing that we would do, but it just so happened it, happened it was on a holiday. So by the shortage of staffing and those types of things, some people would be called out, but we had basically called out a whole other shift to manage the rest of the county. These are the challenges that I refer to and I, I talk to quite a bit of uh, when we're talking about individuals coming in. And where that comes in, I think we've talked about this many times or so, but basically it's just trying to Ta uh, attain individuals to come to the agency or so. We're trying to go through a process now of hiring some, some of the uh, uh, positions that are left void or left vacant. Uh, right now, with this year, uh, we are only funding, we only have enough funding for four deputies out of the 18. So if we were to able to acquire four deputies before this end of the year, we still have 14 deputies that were shot. Uh, and the same thing would go for dispatch or communications there. When we have the 19 that are allocated to us, but we're only funded for about two of those positions there. So these are the challenges that we have, that we, uh, uh, we deal with day in, day out. Um, and I, I think that carries over to other programs uh, when we're trying to provide a service to the, to the public and we don't have the staff or we're short of staff. Um, one, one item is when we talk about not necessarily a deputy or, or, or a uh, communication worker is that because of funding and the lack of ability to attain someone as a criminal analyst, uh, now those duties are pushed off to detectives and what have you. Some of the other incidents I've talked about, those become priorities over dealing with crime statistics and what have you. We know crime statistics are very helpful for us of what we can do to prevent. But in the, at the times and days that we've been going on, we've pretty much been in a reactive type of mode. Um, some of the same situations there, I think our, our partners next door have dealt with until they got staffed and they were able to do some things on a proactive side or so. But those are some of the, the challenges that we have and what we're dealing with. Uh, along with staffing, uh, not only just people, but becomes the equipment and, and um, the items, the, the biggest, the largest item that we deal with, obviously, is the automobiles, the vehicles that the officers patrol in. Uh, I believe we're looking at our vehicles is beginning to age. Uh, we've uh, not been able to purchase vehicles in the manner that we've done in the past to keep our, our motor pool up to a standard of, of being a safe uh, motor pool or, or vehicles for our officers there. And in the course of time, then, when that happens, our maintenance cost goes up for vehicles. Uh, one concern I think of is when we're not uh, staying uh, current with our vehicles, there's a safety factor, not only but uh, vehicles itself being maintenance, but there are safety items that come on newer vehicles that, are, uh, that enhance the safety not only for ourselves but anyone else uh, that's traveling up and down. Um, all these that I talk about, uh, when we talk about some shortages or so and, and how we can get around that is just very difficult but I know uh, one challenge that we look at in the future is when we talk about fuel costs. Uh, I think last year we were able to, we had enough funds that we could forecast to know that we were going to be short just on fuel. 
So we were able to purchase the fuel last year, so they've been draw down on it for this year. That is going to be a challenge for us for next year because uh, we don't uh, forecasting. Will we have that type of, uh, of an avenue to go uh, into next year? I'm doubtful with that. <coughs> with the fuel costs the way they are right now, it's very difficult to tell. But we'll, we're looking at those type of things right there. Uh, public safety. Uh, I think you will see, uh, I think we've seen in, in the media uh, throughout, not only just in Kansas, but also in this nation, in the world, when we talk about domestic terrorism, uh, one of the things that I find of going to conferences or training is that domestic terrorism is a concern for law enforcement uh, for throughout the nation. And one that comes to play is if we think of, and I, I don't like to, but this is the reality of Sandy Hook, where uh, individuals, uh, innocent children, were slain by an individual that had mental health issues. Uh, and from that is twofold. Uh, individuals with mental health is an issue. Uh, I think we will address that in the budget that we're talking about today, but also uh, individuals with mental health tend to well, hurt and harm other people. One of the most harmful things that we can think of is when someone goes into a school and, and injures and kills and maims young kids. Um, we have uh, been able to augment those types of precautions by having officers in, at least in our county schools. I know the city has uh, their SROs or school resource officers. But that's one of the things that can defend against those types of actions there. Uh, my training has been that the, the more presence of a law enforcement in those type of situations generally is a preemptive measure for those types of events to happen. I think we've been successful, but I hold my breath of when we have, we're facing shortages of those, is that something that we would have to do is pull someone out of a school? I hope not. I, I pray not. Um, another thing that we look at is uh, we're doing business differently. Uh, we, we push uh, responsibilities into the individual agencies. Here in the county, we've had uh, the, the luxury of having an IT staff that is capable of taking care of a lot of things uh, because of their challenges that they have. Those, those uh, items of responsibility are now pushed to the different agencies or departments. And from that, then, I'm looking at forecasting when we talk about our uh, computers that we have uh, in our offices and maybe not necessarily in our cars, but basically in the office there. Um, that's an uh, age factor when IT would normally switch out the computers every five years. Well, we're at that stage right now. So those are the types of things that we look at as far as challenges that we have in the future. How do we go about uh, enhancing or at least trying to overcome some of these challenges or so. Obviously, uh, if we can make it attractive for individuals to come to our agency, but also thinking smart, doing things much better. I, I think uh, what we've done in um, some programs, such as looking at, uh, we've got a contract. Is that contract set? Do we need to renegotiate those types of things? I, I got to say that uh, Betty Greiner has worked closely with our county. Uh, she's been a, a terrific asset, asset to the, uh, the county for her expertise as well as our uh, county folks and the expertise. And I think one of the partnerships that we, we get from that is that we're working closer together and we're coming up with some better ideas of how we can go and cut costs. Um, so it's just partnerships. Uh, partnerships uh, that we've done in the past, also we just keep doing that or augment in the future. Uh, we've got the partnerships with Park and Rec. Uh, they've had some issues or so that we've came, we came in and were able to allocate some of our personnel to assist them with some investigations or what have you there. Uh, I know with uh, Tom Block and, and when we're talking about public works, we've been able to uh, partner in on some software. And I think Betty sent something out not long ago when we're talking about the oil, the cost that we have, there was a benefit of partnering in and going in on that, that same or very similar type of contract to cut the cost. So we've got some partnerships that we're working with. That's just within the county. 
we also have the partnerships with our neighbors also with the police department and uh, as well as some of the federal uh, agencies that we work with or so now um, some of the successes I think that we have for my people of what we've been able to do uh, one of the uh, the onset of concealed carry uh, and depends on where it is in the, the, the attitude or the atmosphere uh, of the nation or our state uh, sometimes we get an influx of folks that need to have a permit for concealed carry um, and for that that comes on the uh, responsibility of the sheriff's office there so uh, at, at one point during the past recent past or so we had a backlog of several months we were able to work in and, and do some different things bring some personnel in on some overtime in the weekend and, and try and make that schedule a little bit conducive for individuals not only just the business hours but beyond that and from doing that and working through that we were able to bring that backlog down to just basically minimum of days or so uh, as well uh, with our offender registration we were able to uh, uh, garner a, a, a grant from the Kansas Attorney General's office there where we were able to uh, acquire a new machine for fingerprinting and for that it's not just for offender registrations but we can also use it for concealed carry so we've got items that we can cross over to other units in the agency that makes a, a, a little bit better plan what we have one other partnership and what we've done is enhanced is when we're talking about emergency management we've actually taken one individual and dedicated them full-time to emergency management and from that that individual works closely with the county's emergency management as well as other law enforcement here's one example um, here just last weekend the fiesta parade and because that has a large group of individuals comes in to one particular point there's always that point of not domestic terrorism but just an emergency what do you do so from that then we have a collaboration with the police department fire department as well as emergency management ourselves there and it's uh, incident command management uh, it takes a lot of work but over time we've gotten to the point that we know what we need to do and uh, I think it works best for us because someday someday there's going to be an emergency where we need them in a different situation such as a tornado a flood or, or whatever it is it it's not it's not if it happens it's when it happens we live in Kansas uh, so with those types of partnerships that we have I think it works and it's very conducive for us in the future and with these type of things and, and that's what we have we're working with that other partnerships uh, uh, when we talk about emergencies the yellow freight uh, we partnered in to make sure that we have a space where we allocated so much money into that as well to assist with the county to uh, pay for the communication center on, on the bottom floor um, several other that we work with obviously uh, I know the district attorney was in today uh, that's one of our big partners there what we do several programs coming up in August the national night out whereas the police department district attorney's office sheriff's office we all come in to allocate certain monies and work together on those types of functions and what have you so in any and all those um, those are challenges there are some successes that we have uh, but we know we have those those uh, challenges that will be coming in in the future uh, for what we have uh, with this but again I, I want to say kudos not only to Betty but also to our accounting folks and our command staff for sitting down and working through this now the difficulty is is that trying to get through uh, a budget that is the same as last year is going to be very very difficult simply there were some things that were done of, of uh, enhancements of pay that we didn't have a backfill uh, with those uh, we've got a program when we're talking about the crisis in, uh, incident program uh, that we know that that's going to be a cost to the county granted the county shares that with DOC but that's another cost that comes that's incumbent upon the uh, the agency here um, we've got um, we talked about some of the other obligations that come that were other agencies when we talk about printing of, uh, of forms and what have you there that now is incumbent upon the agency itself so that's why we have those types of costs in there and with that um, 
one other item that, that comes to play that is beyond our control, but when there is a uh, appellate court, Kansas appellate court decision that basically says that if you arrest someone and that individual has injuries, it's, it's falls upon the arresting agency or detaining agency to pay for that bill. So we've asked that uh, we have that included as part of our budget as well. It's a guesstimate. We don't know. This is something new for law enforcement across the state. I know DOC has always had a medical fund set up for individuals that, that uh, deal with, that have issues within the, their confines, but now we're seeing that these are types of issues before that, that individual is actually inside that, that structure there. So those are some of the, the items that we have right there. But anyway, those are some of our challenges and I think some of our, our enhancements that we have of what we can work with our partners. I, I'm big on the partnerships, what we have. I know, uh, Mr. Archer, you've, talk, you've always said uh, about partners and looking at those types of things. And those are the types of things that we look at. And so Good. I'll give it at that and uh, allow you to ask some questions. If you so. Thank you, Sheriff. I, I think it's Commissioner Cooks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Sheriff, <clears throat> front part of your budget, you have a projection with five-year average, three-year average on crime statistics and looking at trends. Do you have, if I read this correctly, patrol answered calls for 2013 was 29,318. And that was out of a total calls of 458,655. And so would I, am I reading this correctly that out of 458,000 calls, 29,000, give or take, are only for the Shawnee County Sheriff to be responding to. Yeah, what, what, what happens of that right there is uh, there are sometimes the calls are made to, uh, whether to the city, and we are there then called upon to augment or help because of their shortages. And if we have an officer available, those are the types of things. And as well, uh, we have officers that travel okay. throughout the city and they run across situations that are right there and they'll take the call for it being with the, with the city or so. Okay. so, yes. But I do see the trend appears that it's going up every year, the number of calls that the sheriff is responding to. Yes, and, and what happens that, and, and I'll give a little bit to that as I, probably two weekends, I have a tendency to go out and, thank you, sir. I have a tendency to go out and, and patrol just to be in touch with what's going on out there. Um, what happens is by not having, uh, being at minimum staffing, the officers are going from one call to the other, one call to the other. So it's not spread out, but I think the calls have gone up. Now, I'll say this though, whenever I speak to a group, I say that we are there to help you and assist you. So when you see something, say something call so some of our calls do go up because of those type of things but yes our calls have gone up do you have it broke down farther or is there a place where i could find or the public could find it broke down farther um, whether those calls were for home break-ins mm -hmm. vandalism burglary you know what they are i mean i know that we have traffic citations issued mm -hmm. um, traffic accidents dui um, but is there a place where i would be able to look at those trends over a three to five year basis? Yes, we've got, we've got those statistics as to those have been reported. Okay. Uh, not necessarily taking the calls of. I'm sure that we can work with communications on, on sifting through those. It would take a little time, but at least for those that definitely have been reported, those are where the report was actually made, we can break those down. One of the things that we have, uh, I've got it here, is the, uh, is the stats of this year. Uh, and it will show that our trend is is that some items go up, some go down. But one of the things that pretty much stays constant is property crime. It's um, something as a burglary to a car. Or right. I say burglary to a car, but it, it could be so much as uh, a vehicle sitting on the side of the road, <clears throat> unlocked, and a laptop there. So an individual. Uh, uninvited goes into the car and takes that. That's a theft. That's a burglary. Goes in there. That's a statistic. 
that could be avoided if it was removed and the door was locked. Now, <clears throat> yesterday the Safe Streets um, allocation made a presentation. They were using the Topeka Police Department statistics, and they were also talking about property crimes and being one of the mm -hmm. highest in property crimes related to um, drug usage. We heard that from the drug court. <clears throat> We heard that from the district attorney, property crimes and drugs, and those all being kind of the same, you know, themed mm -hmm. uh, messages is that, you know, property crimes are related to drug crimes and right. on and on. But I just didn't know if there was a spot where we had the, you know, the Topeka Police Department statistics mm -hmm. where we could find the Shawnee County yeah. Sheriff's statistics. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the things I can provide for you there. Again, that's one of the services that goes to the wayside simply because we don't have that position. We're not able to fund a someone that can do the crime st analysis or statistics. It, it then falls on the shoulders of a detective. Okay. Detectives are busy doing the follow up and those type of things. But I can get some of those those numbers for you. Um, if I read the budget correctly, we have in the sheriff's department 149 vehicles currently, mm -hmm. and you outline that you want to start having those rotated out. Mm -hmm you put in the budget which vehicles you're rolling out is this I mean have we had a planned refresh of vehicles the, what we've done is we've gone away from it simply because of budgetary constraints instead of buying that but what, what we do is we recycle through so many of the vehicles right now uh, majority of our fleet is of about 60 vehicles is a Ford Crown Vic go from anywhere from a 2003 to a 2011 over 60% of those vehicles have 70,000 miles on it. Um, so we, we like to go to about 80,000 where the vehicle is still functioning. And what, what happens at that point is uh, when we reach its maturity level, then we either sell the vehicle or we transfer the vehicle to another entity of, of either our agency or another agency. I, I think I have... Uh, We've got information on here as to the uh, vehicles that we send out to other agencies or so. And I thought I had it marked here. But in essence, we send cars out uh, to the other agencies or so. A and from there, I also have, uh, I thought I had this right here, what the cost of what we've been able to return for those vehicles that are sold at a reasonable cost back to the general fund okay. or so. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a moment just about, you talked about staffing needs, but could you talk for a moment just about compression among your senior staff? Sure. Yeah, what we have right now is uh, simply, again, it becomes that those, uh, it, it all refers back to the, the, uh, the funding of what we have available to us. Right now, we're about 85% of our allocated budget. It goes to personnel. And of that, then, um, we have a senior staff, lieutenants on up, that are outside of the bargaining unit. So what happens is, is uh, it's if the funds are there, we can make some type of adjustments to the senior staff, that's done. But uh, over the last few years, senior staff has not been able to receive those types of uh, salary increases or enhancements similar to those in the bargaining unit. So basically when you have a standstill and there's movement, then you have uh, individuals of a less rank that are making equivalent or just a little below of a supervisor. And in some cases we have some supervisors that are making less than the people they supervise. Uh, so when you have the compaction, uh, or when you, it becomes a compaction by not having the movement uh, up in the salaries or so as it comes up below. And then you have the other issue of uh, uh, if an individual is uh, a, a subordinate and there's an opportunity for a promotion, individual may elect not to. Uh, I think what happens is we then uh, have an opportunity or we, we lessen the opportunity for those that are uh, qualified to move into those ranks or what have you. And if I read your recommendation that the tail end of your budget, there's a form that's listed as a five-year budget, mm -hmm. and it outlines 2015 through 2019, specifically talking about uh, personnel costs 
and with recommended salaries and wage increases. And I just want to make sure that I'm reading this correctly, that your recommendation is five-year sure. budget. Yep, yep, make mm -hmm. sure that we're looking at a 3.42% increase in wages for 2015, 327 in 2016, 544 2017, 4.17 in 2018, 4.17 in 2019. That would cover what you believe to be appropriate wage increases for your staffing needs. Yes, at this time, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and out of that, if we're looking at the civil service for 2015 alone, you make a recommendation of 313,903. That would be to address the compaction issue that you just spoke about. Yes, yes. As opposed to the 117,000 for the union so that you can start to free that up. Right, yes. Okay. And if I look at this also, your current budget is, a uh, flat budget mm. is 14719706. That's correct. You've requested 17098602. If I follow this five-year budget out, you would recommend that it go up to, in 2019, 22134306. Three oh six, and yep. just over the recommended budgets from the sheriff from 2015 to 2019, that's about a $7.3 million increase. Yes. And you believe those to be the appropriate needs for the sheriff? I, I do. I really do. Simply, uh, I think one of the concerns we've had over the time has just been uh, just trying to adequately fund the, the agency for the personnel. So... Um, I think if we if we look at just of of that alone mm -hmm. over the last few years or so, uh, if we look at 13 of losing uh, deputies, just deputies, just deputies alone, uh, and in the in 13 we lost three deputies, and 12 uh, it was one, two three four five deputies, and then of this year the first part of this year uh, we had a loss of. Again, five deputies, half of this year, we've lost that. Now, we've tried to replenish that, but trying to get individuals on into the door and at least be able to test has been a challenge. Now, if I also understand, you have your budget request, and it outlines the uh, statutes, the statutory authorities for the sheriff. If I understand our role as Board of County Commissioners, once I've set a budget for the sheriff, Outside of a bargaining unit, you're free to do with it whatever you may please. Yeah. According to statute, yes. According to statute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Subject to the next year for the county commission sure. to do. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> but you could choose not to, if you received an increase in the overall budget for the sheriff, you could still choose not to address compaction or compression. You could decide that, you know, instead you need more equipment. Right. So... That falls under the discretion of the sheriff. Yes, and, and that's where it's, it's been over the last few years, the discretion of that, of what you have allocated as not to fill positions, just so that you can make sure that you make it to the end of the year. So, You have uh, several positions that are not filled at this spot. Are all necessary, or can some be deactivated? Well, in, in what I had of this year, an understanding of the constraints that are there and the the issues that you're dealing with, I'm not looking at a complete filling of positions right now. It's a, it's a plan to fill those slots each year. So of that right there, what we're looking at a filling of six positions for 2015. That gives us some relief. Uh, it's not there yet for the services that I think we should be providing to the individuals. I think we do a great job for those folks that are there and that are dedicated throughout the end of the agency. Uh, but but here's, here's the point I'm, I'm trying to get at. I understand budget issues, mm -hmm. but I also understand of what, what you and I are entrusted upon, and that's providing the best service that we can. Um, one of the things that I, I see of that is uh, right now, the people that are there, I think of is we have our gas, our, we have our foot on the gas and we've got that engine revved up pretty hard okay. right now uh, with minimum relief. Eventually, the engine 
wears out or when it gets tired. And that's why I see of our folks right now, they're working, uh, they're taking on the extra load. I'm not saying that doesn't happen in other agencies, but this does take a wearing effect on our people throughout the agency, particularly those out on the field and those in dispatch. Last question I have, and this one is somewhat touchy, I understand, but it's the appropriate time, I feel. Given the sheriff's forfeiture fund, which you are authorized by statute to have, you have complete discretion over it. The county commission can't tell you how to spend the forfeiture fund. But the sheriff can use the forfeiture fund to pay for equipment. You cannot use it for salaries, right. but can use it for equipment and training. You cannot but, use it to augment But you cannot the, use the it budget. to augment right. your budget. It's something well. that's not set up for the budget, yes. Right. But if you saw a need within your department, you would be able to use it to replace equipment Oh yeah. If you so chose. Oh yeah. We've we've done that in the past. Uh, we did for some of the equipment for SWAT or whatever it right. is, as well as for for training. Which, uh, but it could once you free up that money for equipment, could use other monies for compre to address the compression issue. I'm not sure. I, I, you could if you're not if you're not using the budget for equipment. If you use some of your forfeiture fund for equipment. That money is then freed up to address salaries, which would be a budgetary need. And again, I'm not sure you can use it for salaries. So. No, you could never use forfeiture, right. and that's not what I'm saying. Okay. If your budget is 14 million or okay. 17 million, right? Instead of using part of your budget to pay for equipment, you use the equipment to be paid for out of your forfeiture fund. Again, that falls within your discretion. You would have money left over in your budget. To pay for salaries, because again, that falls at your discretion. Correct. I get you. Yes. But that again falls within the discretion of the sheriff. Correct. As Correct. you saw the, the, as you see needs met. Correct. Okay. That's all I have. Commissioner Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> Tough act to follow. No, whose <clears throat> phone is ringing now? I'm oh, okay. is that yours? No. <laughs> no, Mayor's just calling kidding. me. Yeah, yeah, no, so. that's right. that's right. um, sir, how many total deputies do you have? Total. Right now, 104. 104. Okay. okay. Of the allocated of uh, 122. Okay. Alrighty. Um, and just to clarify, I, the sheriff's office didn't experience any cuts last year. Yes, we did. Some. How much? And, and, and I, it, now here's what I say with that. The cuts that we deal with is the lack of being able to hire okay. because of that. So it's we not that we have it to get rid of. We don't have it. Right. So that's why I'm just putting it in semantics that we and haven't had the we, people. We didn't reduce the allocation. No, no. we increased it. Increased it. Yeah. Okay. okay. We increased it by almost 400000 mm -hmm. Okay. I just, just for the record, okay. I just, I yeah. just no. want to make sure that... Um, uh, because I know there were several age, several departments that did experience cuts, and yeah. I think public safety was put as a priority mm -hmm. last year, and and even this morning, Betty, you know, mentioned that 46 percent of our budget um, so far this year has been spent on public safety, yes. and so <clears throat> I, you know, I know you sympathize with us. Um, it, it is a very difficult position to be in. Um, to weigh all these different departments, everybody is here expressing their needs, and I don't, I don't blame them for that. That's your job, right? Yeah, right. And so I hope as we go forward, as you said in the beginning, honor, integrity, and professionalism goes both ways. Oh yeah. I hope so from all the department and all the commission. Oh yeah. So I, I respect completely what you do. Thank you. I appreciate that too. Please pass that on. Yeah. No more. Okay. Um, I had a couple of items. The uh, and, and I share Commissioner Cook's thoughts on on statistics for levels, trends, and comparisons. I know the the uh, chief of police does a quarterly report, a crime report, to the public to let us know how he's doing and how uh, TPD is doing. Would that be something that the sheriff's office could do to get the word out? that we're doing a good job. These are the categories that we track. Uh, these are our five-year levels, trends, and comparisons. Would that be something that the sheriff's office could do 
to tell to tell the success story that we sure. think we have. Oh yeah, I, I think w what what came across is that we didn't provide. I think when we work with Safe Streets as well as the police department mm -hmm. there, we were providing that. It's just they were not displayed. That information was was pretty much heavy loaded on the city side of that. We were providing that uh, at one particular time. Again, without having that crime analysis individual there, that's something that has to, we had to put our priorities elsewhere. So these are the types of services I'm having. But I'm sure we can come up with something uh, okay. that we can, and we can even disseminate that on our website, you know, and we can put those types of things out there. We've got a lot of statistics that we put out or so. All right. That's just a suggestion that we go to the public on a quarterly basis and uh, give us comparisons, uh, levels, and trends of how we're doing uh, in the in the sheriff's department. I've always said if if we tell our success stories, we build goodwill with the public, and if we build uh, you know an account of goodwill, then we have to do things that we don't want to do, like right. raise property taxes. It's more understandable. Uh, the other the other item I wanted to ask you about um, is the the city of Topeka had performed a resource allocation study and the and the results were reported on that I don't know a couple of weeks ago and they did the study with peer cities and I think there were ten or twelve peer cities and they never came out and really gave uh, any uh, explanations, but you could infer, looking at the information, that Topeka Police Department was was much overstaffed per capita compared to the peer cities. They were much overstaffed. They uh, had uh, a lot more leadership positions than the peer cities, and their payroll was much higher per capita on the peer cities, and. I guess looking at that information, how do we know that we're not overstaffed in the sheriff's department? Well, without you know having something in mind, I'm around the state quite a bit, uh, and for the size of our agency, size of our population there, I would say that we're probably pretty much uh, right at or below some of the others. Have we ever uh, looked at per capita for well our, our deputies in our in Shawnee County as opposed to Johnson or Sedgwick or uh, Wyandotte. I mean, I don't know. I don't I, know how I don't we look at yeah. staffing and force management in the sheriff's mm -hmm. office to where we are understaffed, overstaffed, we really need more. Pay. I've never seen anything empirical right. that would tell me. I, I don't have anything okay. in, in place okay. right here, there, but right. I know there have been some, but I don't have that right in my head or so, but I'm sure there's there have been some studies done. Okay. okay. Um, Anything else? Betty, did you have anything? No. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. will reconvene at 2.30 to talk to Dr. Glenn. Thank you, Sheriff.